All right, let's start reading in verse 16. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? And some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Now understand, at this time, what Paul was teaching, it was a new doctrine, wasn't it? Obviously, Jesus had... Uh, you know, come to earth not long before that and pay, died on the cross. So this was something new. It wa- it, this was actually a new doctrine that was being brought into this part of the world. And it got their attention, though. They, they wanted to know this new doctrine. They, they wanted to hear, they wanted to know what this was all about. And it says in verse 21, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hills and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. And then, of course, you know, he preaches unto them about Jesus. It turned out these people, while they had all these gods, they had idols all over the place. There was one uh, spot where they say there was a, uh, you know, it was like a spot where normally you would set an idol or God and there wasn't anything there, but it said to the unknown God. And that's the one that Paul decides he's going to tell them about. It turns out there's one that some of you were ignorantly worshiping. You didn't know who he was, but he's the one I want to tell you about. And notice how these people in this story, you know, they're, they're interested because This was a new doctrine that was coming along and they were, they just were always obsessed and caught up with any new thing that came along. And what I want to talk about tonight, and I kind of use these people as an illustration. um, You all hear me talk about trendies all the time, don't you? You hear me use that term. And I've had a lot of people ask me because they'll hear me sometimes in a message, just refer to a trendy and they're like, what's a trendy? You know, and and if, and if you don't know me well, if you haven't heard a lot of my preaching, uh, you know, you might not know for sure what a trendy is. And and so uh, what I want to do tonight is I want to share or give a profile of a trendy, all right? Because I have declared myself the anti-trendy, all right? If it's trendy, I'm not interested in it. I just, I I don't like trendies. I don't like trendyisms. There are some people out there that I would put in the category of trendy that I think they're decent people, decent churches, but um, I, I wouldn't even call them heretics or anything like that. But I will say, if I, if I could just be real honest, I don't like them, all right? You know, they're, they're just, it's, it's not my cup of tea, not what I'm interested in. And I, but I do believe there's some, there's some dangers in that mindset. And there, there's many examples I want to show you in the scriptures of people who have that, you know, this, these trendies, while their methods today, the things they're doing are new, you know, the, the principles of what they're doing are not new. Trendies have always been around. These people, the Athenians, they were the trendies of that day. There, there's no doubt about that. And they, did, they got all excited about a new doctrine. But, but So the trendy, though, you know, he is, he's difficult to define because he's constantly changing. You know, they're constantly changing based on what's trending, okay? So well, my description of a trendy today and I'll share some things, you know, just kind of some uh, common things you'll see amongst the trendies as far as what they do, what they teach. But here's the thing, a month from now, that might be different. And a year from now, it will be very different. But these principles, okay, that I'm going to be teaching tonight against being a trendy, and that's my term, that's not a biblical term, but I, I just can't think of anything better to call them, and I just like the sound of it too. Um, they're, they are, they're timeless, okay? This stuff has always been around. And so the trendies, they're, they're like this group in Acts. They're always looking for a new thing. And sometimes they accidentally get some things right. Okay? This group here that was completely given over to idolatry, 
Turns out they had one God. They had one inscription there to an unknown God who they were ignorantly worshiping. Paul's like, let me tell you about this one right here. And you know what? There are some things that trendies do. You could even say there are some things that trendies start. You know, they're the first ones to do it. That it turns out, you know what? That wasn't a bad thing. Okay? And because, uh, you know, we do, you know, there's, there's um, well, I'll get into some of the specifics in a little bit. But there are, there's a lot of things that they are into, that they do, that they're not bad. You know, even right now, some things that are trending amongst these people. I can't show you a scripture where what they're doing is bad. I can tell you right now, I'm going to keep my distance. I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to let them test this stuff out. I'm going to let them experiment and see what happens with it. And they might accidentally get some things right. And then later on, uh, you know, we might do some of those things here. For example, too, you know, there was a time, I'm sure there was a time I wasn't around that people probably got scared when the PA system started coming into churches. You know, I mean, what's going on with these PA systems? You know, the Hayes, you've told me about the church that you went to years ago where everybody panicked when they brought in an indoor toilet. You know, you don't use the bathroom in a church. You know, there was a time that that was probably trendy to have indoor plumbing in a church, and it probably freaked some people out. Uh, obviously, I don't think those things uh, were, were bad. And it was probably the trendies that did it first, the trendies of those days. But at the same time, let's, let's look at what the Bible teaches on some of these things, and let's look at these people and find out, you know, why this attitude, you know, it is, it's dangerous because their eagerness to be part of the latest and greatest and everything, it just causes them to constantly proceed without caution, and it usually gets them in trouble. And so, that trendy, first thing we need to realize about the trendy is they're, they're someone, they do, they're always trying to be in the cutting edge of everything. They want to be cutting edge in technology. They want to be cutting edge in their methods. They are, you know, listen, I understand the trendy. They'll make fun of us too because, you know, we'll bash the trendies for, you know, preaching in their jeans and Hawaiian shirts and, you know, uh, you know, not wearing the suit and tie. We'll get on to them for those things. And they're like, do you think the Apostle Paul preached in a suit and tie? No, uh, I, I don't. But I can guarantee you he didn't dress like the Athenians did, the trendies of that day. And you know what? It might have been the trendies of the 1800s, early 1900s, the start of the whole suit and tie thing. That is very possible. But you know what? There are some things that I get, you can kind of say change over time. But at the same time, I'm not going to try to be cutting edge on those things. I'm going to watch and see what happens with some of these things. I want to see what happens with the churches. You know, the first churches that decide, you know what, we're going to lose the suit and tie when we preach. We're going to go casual. I want to watch what happens to those churches. And you know what? In my experience so far, what I am seeing what's happening to these churches who are going casual, everything's going south in those churches. The music goes south. Most of them end up losing the King James Bible. They get weak on doctrine. I mean, when was the last time you know, has there ever been a time where you were in one of these casual churches and you got heard a preacher getting up there and ripping on things like homosexuality? They don't do that. Churches like that, they don't take strong stands doctrinally. And that casual look, all right, while you're not violating any biblical command by not wearing a suit and tie when you preach, but you know what? These people who are cutting edge and doing those things, I'm watching where their churches are going, and let me tell you, it's not somewhere I want to go. So you know what? I'm going to keep wearing the suit and tie. And if another group comes along that maybe dresses a little bit different, and they are, after a long period of time, they're still going on for God, doing great things for God, I might pay a little bit of attention to that. Because we haven't been wearing the suit and tie for 2,000 years, okay? I'm not even going to pretend that that's the case. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried about being cutting edge. You know, the, you know they, they want to be cutting edge on the technology. And, you know, and we look like idiots when us old pathers, if you want to, or whatever they would want to call us, you know, we'll make fun of them wearing their little microphone things that they wear across their face. All right. But, you know, at one time, there was probably people that were bashing the lapel mics. You know, there was a time when that was trendy. And, you know, and so in, the day may come where it is extremely common 
I won't even say the name I've heard you know, some preachers call those mics. I, I, I won't repeat it in church, but I think it's a great name for it. I'm not going to do it. But, you know, you, do, you, you look like an idiot, but here's the thing. When you, you do, you're, you're watching where these churches go. These people have to be cutting edge on everything. They are, they're all weak doctrinally. They don't preach hard. You know, they're, they don't take strong stands on anything. And so, you know what, I'm going to, I'll keep watching. You know, when it comes to those microphones they wear across the face, the jury's still out on that one. I'm, I'm, I'm watching those churches and I'm not liking what I'm seeing. So, you know what, I'm going to stay old Paz and I'm going to use a lapel mic. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing that kind of thing. And when I see those churches all, you know, on fire for God and doing great things for God, maybe I'll get into some of that stuff. And then two, you know, maybe I'll worry about some of that stuff when we actually have a big massive auditorium where I need something like that. Okay. You know, we really don't even need those things now, but you know, they, they want to be cutting edge on their, you know, on their methodology. You know, whatever the new thing is that people are doing in church, they want to use the latest music. You know, they got to use, uh, you know, it, you know, the screens, the double screens in every church, no matter how small the auditorium is, they have to have the double screens. They got to have the music up on the screens. They, you know, they, they have to do all the stuff exactly alike. You know, it just, it, it, it's definitely trending. It is a trending thing to be using those things. And I don't like the direction those, those people are going. And so, you know what? I, I'm going to plan on remaining behind the times in technology on purpose. Why is that? You're, well, you know, eventually you might use some of those things. Yes, after they've been tested, after they have been proved. After I have seen what kind of consequences they have on a church, if I see that they are helping that church, maybe I will use some of those things. But I'm not seeing that. I am not, I, you know, I'm not trying to bash other churches. But the churches that are cutting edge on technology, that are cutting edge on methodology, I am not impressed with one bit. In fact, if I could just be real honest, I'm actually disgusted by them. Okay? And, not, and it's not the technology that bothers me. It's the lameness of the preaching. You know, I will, you know, I, I'll pay attention to the guy who's got the double screens, you know, who's not wearing the suit and tie. When he is up, I mean, preaching a fire-breathing message, I mean, hammering sin, you know, ha even if he just says queer, I might pay attention to that guy, but they're not going to say that stuff. If you hear them preaching against sodomites, it's always followed up with an apology for their own sin too. You know, I mean, you know, what, you know, how dare we pick on the sun? You know, we're all sinners. You know, it's all, it, it's just, it's lame, it's pathetic, and it is common with pretty much without exception in churches that are cutting edge and all these things. And so that you know, this the danger of being cutting edge and everything is. These people, they're not taking into consideration the long-term effects of their decisions. And that brings me to a verse I want to share that they hate. They hate this verse. And listen, this verse has been so overused. It's been so worn out. It has been so, uh, or misused, I guess. You, you know, you can't overuse scripture, but you can misuse scripture. But Jeremiah 6.16 you know, Jeremiah 6, 16, Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. And listen, we hear the guys, the guys all the time talking about old paths, and usually it's followed by a description of church in the 70s. And it drives everybody nuts, all right? It drives the trendies crazy. Trendies hate hearing the term old paths. They hate it. But listen, this is what old paths are. Old paths, is, it's a path that has been tested, a path that has been tried. You know what's on that path. You know what's down that road. You know what obstacles you're going to face on the old path. There might be some new routes that you could take. There might be some new waves that we could pave for, you know, on how to do things when it comes to building a church. But do you understand that it's just, it's dangerous to try that. We don't know what's going to be on those other paths. These people that are trying to blaze these new trails, we don't know where they're going. We don't know where things are going to end up. But on, those who are on the old paths, those have been tested. It turns out they work. They get you where you're supposed to go. They get you where you want to be. They are safe. And I think that's a good attitude to have. You know what? I'm going to take the old paths. 
well, eventually all these things you're talking about will be old paths. Okay, well, when they're old paths, then I'll take them because then I'll know they're safe. Then I will know where they lead. And once again, when I do, when I see one of these high tech churches, when I see one of these trendies, I mean, preaching the truth without compromise, getting souls saved, seeing great things for God, not building a great big, big Chuck E. Cheese fun center. When I see that going on, I might pay attention to some of their methods and things they're using. But as long as they're just having a community fund center, as long as they're bringing in the mayors and the politicians and bringing in lost people and honoring them in church, I'm going to say, forget you people. Well, you know, when they're getting away from what the Bible says, you know, forget you. When, you know, when, when, usually when the screen comes in, the hymns go out. Because you know one of the reasons they want to bring the screens in is because the hymns are boring to them. They want the new songs. You know, they want, they want the, you know, they're, they're bored with these old things. And when I do, when I see them actually accomplishing something and the path has been tried and worn down and proven, then I'll pay attention to some of that stuff. But in the meantime, I'm just going to, I'm going to stick to the old paths. I'm going to stick to stuff that's been tested. And you know what? I know a lot of churches where they use lapel mics and they're still preaching strong, <laughs> preaching the truth. But you know what? I've not seen one guy wearing one of those microphones that I don't want to call the name of. I want to use it so bad. I, I shouldn't do it, though. But I haven't seen, I, I have never seen a guy preaching with one of those things and just breathing fire and just preaching truth. And when I do, when I see somebody doing that, I'll, I'll pay attention. But I haven't seen it yet. And it is. It's just a bunch of softball throwing, just limp-wristed, pink shirt wearing, you know, just goofballs and so you know what i'm out and you know, forget about it. i'm not not interested in it but you know the effect but one thing i can say when it comes to these high-tech churches the effects of technology it has clearly dumbed us down you see i think i think this is you know we've already seen the effects you know it's made us lazy it's you know people they don't even know their way through the bible they don't know they don't know how to find their way through scriptures people don't know how to read music today you know, and that, that's not just a church problem. That's a cultural thing. You know, we're not interested in that stuff anymore. But they're, they're dependent on that technology. And if they don't have a screen up there showing them what to do, then they don't know what to do. And if they don't have a screen in front of them, they're bored. Listen, we were at the museum. We were, you know, we were in Chicago this week at the museum. You're at a museum. You pay a bunch of money to go to a museum. They've got all this cool old stuff there. There's things everywhere. And, and even in the museum, there's a lot of cool visual things. We're at the Museum of Science and Industry, and they have this, like, tornado thing there. where They got this, like, tornado right there in the building. It's pretty cool. I, I enjoy just staring at that thing. It was really neat. But you know what all these millennial bozos are doing? Walking around with, staring at their cell phones. It's like, you people are in a stinking museum. You paid all this money to go to a museum. And what are you doing in the museum? You're not reading anything. You're not learning anything. You know, you're on your stinking cell phone the whole time. Taking selfies. Listen, you know, how many, you know how many people we saw taking selfies when we were in the city? That is all people do is take selfies the whole time. And, I, you know, we, we were talking about when we were in the city, you know, like, you know, what if, like, an apocalypse starts? And, you know, you've all seen the chaos movies, and it's always in a city. And I was just like, you know what? If things, like, start going bad here and everything just starts going crazy, I was like, I'm just, I think we just... Us three, we just go around, we just start beating up these millennials on their cell phones because they're driving me nuts. I've never seen so many selfie sticks in all my life. Who wants to walk around a city and through a museum carrying a selfie stick the whole time you're around? But everybody, it's like the new cane, you know? It's like, you know, the, 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 you know that's a great invention, a cane that you can use as a selfie stick. Then it's not a pain care. Man, I just, I'm going to make a bunch of money with that, all right? But yeah, but, but it, it just, it bugged me to death. Just, uh, but it is that that's people today. They can't do that. And if they have to sit in a service and stare at a person, they can't do it. And even in a lot of these churches today where they're, they do things, you know, they'll get these young millennial people in and you'll see them. They're out there on their cell phone during the service because they can't function out these things. Listen, technology, I understand it. I, it's good. We use some of it, but it, I believe for the most part, it's dumbing us down. And can we not have one hour during the week where we are not using technologies and staring at backlit screens? Is that, is that not possible? 
Listen, these people today, these millennials, they spend their entire lives staring at screens. Why do we need to have a church service where all they do is stare at a screen the whole time? Well, how are we going to get them in? Well, listen, if they're just going to come in and ruin everything, I tell them not to come in. You know, we're going we're gonna to do church the way it needs to be done, and we're not going to dumb everyone else down. And I, I do, I believe it's, it's hurting these people. People are, they're dependent on technology. But the trendy, he gets bored with traditional things and they're constantly trying to figure out how to amp things up. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word, verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall be turned away, uh, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Okay, Bible says right here, be in, in season, out of season. Okay, the trendy, they're always doing what's trending. They're always doing what's in season. Well, guess what? Hard preaching right now is out of season. But what did Paul say? When it goes out of season. That's when you got to amp things up. You know, that's when you got to put on the, you know, get the smoke, you know, fog makers up on the stage and the fancy lightings and the fireworks going off behind you. And then people will listen if you really learn how to put on a good show and put on good entertainment. No, what did he do? He said, be instant in season, out of season. You keep doing the same thing even when it's not in season or even when it's not trending. And let me tell you, it's not, it, this isn't trending right now. He said, the time will come. Well, they will not endure sound doctrine. What does that mean? There's going to be a time where people aren't going to be comfortable hearing sound doctrine. It's going to make people cringe. People cringe when they hear hard preaching today. When you preach against you know, fornication, when you preach against adultery and, and sodomy and things like that, they cringe. They get nervous. They don't want to hear that. But the Bible says, be instant. You got to keep doing it. It's not trending. But you've got to keep doing that same thing. They're not going to want to endure it because it's, it's, it's making them uncomfortable. But after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, be turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. And you see what's going on in these trending churches, when you're doing what is trending, what trends is what people are interested in, what people are lusting after and you know what today rather than hearing hard preaching people would rather a guy get up in a pink shirt and tell him a nice fluffy story oh. and listen you know, and, and you hear me talk all the time about pastor trending his pink shirt you know why you know, why do you have to throw in the pink shirt thing you know, listen here's why they wear the pink shirt because baptist preachers have a history of being kind of intimidating you know, it used to be very common where preachers yelled and where they would scream and where they would maybe even throw things around and kick pulpits and, you know, throw, kick over microphone stands and, you know, just kind of get a little out of hand. You know, nowadays, you know, and I tell you, people have changed. One of the things that has changed Baptist churches more than anything is social media and the fear of things going viral. Listen, it was not that long ago, folks. I remember it. I wish, you know, but unfortunately, sermons, the things I grew up listening to, the meetings I grew up going to, I don't, I don't have video proof I, because they didn't video everything. They didn't post it on the Internet. I don't have video proof of these things. But let me tell you, I do have my memory. And the things that people are bashing us for preaching today, everybody used to preach it. And listen, if I could just take, you know, you know, Pastor Stephen Anderson, one of the most well-known preachers today for just being kind of crazy when he preaches, kicking stuff, throwing things, jumping up on pulpits, you know, calling sodomites names, talking about, you know, death penalty for sodomites. Everybody, every, all these people that are bashing him for it today, I remember when they did it. I remember going to these meetings and hearing all these creative ways that we could take all the homos out somewhere and get rid of them. I heard that stuff all the time growing up. Not that long ago. But listen, something started happening. Things started going viral on the internet. 
persecution started coming. The news media started picking up on some of these things and it freaked these churches out because it was freaking out the church members. And Mr. Moneybags in the church didn't like being associated with that publicly. Listen, there, everybody used to love hearing that. When these guys would preach that and they would start talking about putting all the homos in a boat and taking them out in the middle of the ocean, you know, with only enough gas to get to the middle of the ocean and just leaving them out there, everybody used to start shouting and laughing. But whenever it got to the day where it started going viral on the Internet and then maybe their co-workers and things would see those video clips and say, that's the church you go to? Oh, no, I don't believe in that. And then all of a sudden they start distancing themselves. Money bags, leaves, goes to the liberal church. So he doesn't have to deal with the stigma of that. And what do these preachers all start doing? They all start buckling. They all start compromising. They all start backing up. But then you've got guys like Stephen Anderson. He decided not to change with the times. What does he do? He says that stuff and he posts it on the internet himself. And you know what? All these other preachers... It scares them to death because they know they used to preach that same way. They know that they, they believe what he says. They'll say it too when they're behind closed doors. They'll say it too when they're preaching somewhere where they know it's not going to go out on the internet. But, you know, they, and it, amongst their buddies, amongst other preachers, they'll do it because that's what they believe. But when it comes to taking a strong public stand, they're out. They're not, they're not going to do it. They're scared. Right. And you know what? We, need, we, got, we have to keep preaching the truth. We can't let churches like theirs, and they can't keep letting churches like ours look like we're kind of some radical hate group because of what we believe. They all believe it. All the fundamental Baptist churches believe this, but they're not open about it. And so we're forced to look like you know, fringe weirdos, and we're not. And they need to be vocal about it. And it needs to just be a common thing. And then you know what? It's not a big deal anymore. If everybody's doing it, if everybody's preaching that, the truth in those things, it's not going to be a big deal anymore. And it's not going to make news when that happens. The queers aren't going to waste their time protesting some of these churches. There's just too many of them. But if, they can, if the news media can succeed at making some of these churches like a bunch of wacko fringe groups all by themselves, then they have succeeded. But when all the churches, if they would just go back to doing what they used to do 10 years ago, I don't know how long YouTube's been around, but, you know, it, it did. It, it changed these people. And the Bible says be instant in season, out of season. I think we ought to be thankful for this technology. You know, we have the ability now to spread our message more than ever. And I, I, thank, I thank God for that. I'm going to take advantage of that. I want to try to reach as many people and as many places as I can. I, you know, there's people that listen to some of my preaching that you know live in some of these European countries where they're not allowed to preach like this, where it's illegal. Those, those people still need to hear it. You know, I mean, I wish there were some preachers over there that would at least go do it behind the closed doors, would we'll at least do it in private. Yeah, Canada, same thing. You know, it, they, these people still should be able to find places doing it. Those people don't have to put it out there on the Internet and stuff like that. But you know what? They should, they should be able to hear it. But you know what? If they can't, well, if I can provide them some of that, I'm glad to do it. And let these people know who are actually real Bible-believing Christians living in these places that, you know what? They're not alone. They're not weirdos. They're not wackos. This stuff is, is true. And you know what? A lot more people believe it than they realize. It's just people are getting scared because this type of thing, it's not trending. It's not what everybody's talking about. They do, we're, we're supposed to be telling the same, sharing the same old story. Tell me the old, old story. You're not going to hear them singing that in the trendy church. They might sing it out of obligation, but then they're going to go try to tell a new story. You know, they're turned unto fables. They do. They love the storytellers. They'll bring in the professional storytellers. You should go to some of these youth conferences. All right, now listen, I know teenagers are dumb. But listen, teenagers are not near as dumb as a lot of these churches make them out to be. And they do. They have these youth conference speakers that come in and they do cartwheels and they, you know, they tell stories and they do all, they tell jokes. And, you know, it's just like, you know, how stupid do you think these kids are? Listen, teenagers can understand Bible doctrine. Kids can understand 
Bible doctrine, if you'll just, just you know, teach them. But boy, you know, that's not, they're, not, they're not trying to do that. They're using all the new stuff. They're trying and just doing what's trending. And you know what? It's a guy doing cartwheels, doing a juggling act, doing a little song and dance or whatever. That's going to get teenagers' attention more than a guy doing hard preaching, preaching the truth. But you know what? Doing cartwheels isn't going to help any teenagers. You know, you're not, you're not going to help them with that kind of thing. And we've got, to, we've got to be instant, in season, out of season. Keep doing the same thing. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to be continuing to do the things the same. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. We're supposed to be doing the same thing. Continuing on in the same thing. But that boredom, and it, it often leads to finding interest in things better off ignored. First Timothy chapter uh, 1 verse 3 says, And as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went unto Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. The vain jangling, vain jangling it's just like random talk. And these trendies too, they, they get caught up in these weird things they get all bogged down on weird things that just don't matter. Things that aren't, there, there's no godly edifying to that. Maybe it's stuff, it sounds good, it sounds interesting, it makes them sound smart. But it's very clear when you listen to these people, these vain janglers, they do not know what they're talking about. And just, you know, here, here's a list of what I call popular trendyisms, okay? Some very popular trendyisms, and that's, that's a word I made up, that you will hear and many of these churches, and I don't have time to preach on these things, but in your typical trendy church, Pastor Trendy in his pink shirt, he will probably preach on all of these things uh, at one time or another, but for one of the things is tithing is just Old Testament. Very popular trendyism. Don't have time to disprove how stupid that is, but you know one of the things they like to bring up all the time, and they're just picking this stuff up off the internet, is, you know, in the Old Testament, when they tithe, they tithe food. When you tithe in your church, do you bring food? Well, listen, did you get paid with food? If you get paid with food and you want to tithe with food, go ahead. But you know what? We don't get paid with food today, do we? We get paid with money. So what do we tithe with? We tithe with money. Okay, back then, food, it was, it was kind of like currency. But that, that's just a stupid argument. That, you know what that's called? That's called vain jangling. It's clear you don't know what you're talking about when you say things like that. That, is, that thinking is so easy to disprove it's not even funny, but they're all teaching it. And they all say the same stupid stuff. you tithing with food? And they all bring that up. You know, that was a Levitical thing. They, they say these things all the time because you know what? It feels good to hear, I don't have to tithe. And then that money you were planning on putting in the offering, you know, you can go out and buy a new outfit with it or something. You know, they, it, you know that, yeah, that's going to make them popular. Trendies are desperate to be loved. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, another trendyism is, you know, Old Testament law doesn't matter. When you start talking about the unpleasant things, the death penalty, you know, morality, that's Old Testament. That, that's, Old Te that's Old Testament law. It doesn't matter. And then these same bozos, too. Well, Old Testament goes until the death of the testator. So now we don't even have to do the things that Jesus taught while he was on earth. Only the things that were after the cross that were taught. That, you know, so we don't even have to worry about the Beatitudes, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Throw that stuff out. That's not really expected of it. Of us. Jesus preached those things to just prove that we're sinners, but he doesn't actually expect us to do those things. Yes, he does, okay? It's clear when you say things like that, you just don't know what you're talking about. That's called vain jangling. Wine is okay. That's another popular trendyism. They, they all teach that wine's okay, drinking in moderation. Once again, don't have time to preach in that. All they're doing is proving they don't know what they're talking about, just like it says in 1 Timothy 1.7. Understanding neither what they say or, nor whereof they affirm. They don't know. Uh, you know, Death penalty in the Old Testament. They throw that, that stuff's out. 
And if, if you do, if you start talking about death penalty for queers or something like that, well, you know, it's for adultery too. And if you ever looked at a woman to lust after her because you've committed adultery in your heart, you should be put to death. Once again, you're just proving how stupid you are. You're proving how little you understand the scripture. That is called vain jangling. And I said, I can just prove all that stuff easy. You know, don't pick on the sodomites because we're all sinners too. I listen, there's a group out there on the internet that they try to pretend they're not trendies, but I'm telling you, these guys are a bunch of trendies. They fit a lot of stereotypes. I read a stupid article. Everybody was praising this guy for this article he wrote against transgenders in the military. And it was the most weak, lame thing I've ever heard in my life. And before he's bashing transgenders, he's apologizing for all his sins first. You know, and just... You know, and, and he said the same thing. He, one of the things he said in there, popular trendyism, popular trendy saying, you know, we need to do more to show these people the love of Jesus. And when I hear them say that, you know, I just want to slap these people over the head. You know, the Bible teaches that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. These people, they rejected God. It's not that they weren't shown the love of Jesus. They hate God. That's why they do those things. And it's like, you know, we got to figure out, you know, what can we do to show the LGBTQ community the love of Jesus? Sorry, they've already been showed and they rejected it. And that is why they have been given over to a reprobate mind. But that's out of season right now. That's not trending right now. Showing them the love of Jesus, that statement, that is trending. But that's just completely unbiblical. That's completely false. They're just denying so many different things, but they do. They all say that, and it sounds popular. And these guys out there, these preachers in these meetings where they're saying that, these guys wearing their skinny jeans and their pink shirts, they get all excited when they hear that stuff. Because, you know, if, if we have too much freedom bashing queers, it's going to be, you know, we're going to start bashing them for looking like one. Listen, when I was a kid, it was an insult to get called that. You know, we didn't do any. You know, if, if we did anything. Girl, you know, you got called a queer and things like that. I remember we'd play basketball. We'd play smear the queer, uh, things like that, you know, and just, and, and, you know, nobody, nobody wanted to be the queer. You know? But nowadays, I, I guarantee you that game's been banned from school uh, today. I don't know what they call it now, but uh, I, gu- I guarantee you that. But I went to a Christian school, so we got away with that stuff. But, uh, you know, a tr- another trend is, you know, they, they've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. They're always about grace, grace, grace. And listen, I am all for preaching about the grace of God, but what these people are talking about, it's not, they, they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And that, that's another message too we could preach on. But these are, they're just, these are trending things that everyone's talking about. And it's vain jangling. It's random talk. These people clearly don't know what they are talking about, but it sounds good. It's in season. It's trending. And it will get you retweeted if you tweet stuff like that. But it's wrong. It's not what we're supposed to be preaching. It's not what it's not what God has called us to teach. And so the you know the trendy, they are they're extremely socially aware and are greatly influenced by society. Look at Exodus chapter 32. Turn over to Exodus chapter 32. I'm running out of time here. This is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Exodus chapter 32, verses 1. It says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, oh, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Okay, Moses is delayed. They're not know what's going on. What happens? They get bored. Okay, and it's like today, you know, we're waiting for Jesus to come back and people are getting bored and people are starting to demand things. You know, we got to amp things up in church. We need to change things. The music's old. It's lame. Uh, you know, the Bible's hard to understand. We got to update these things. And they do. They're putting the pressure on these preachers. You know, God has left us, you know, as preachers, kind of, you know, in charge. We're supposed to set an example, supposed to be preaching the word until the chief shepherd appears. And what are these guy preachers doing? They're buckling to the pressure of the people, just like Aaron did. Aaron didn't even put up a fight. And then turn over to, he just, you know, he just goes right along with, and then jump to verse 21. And Moses, and this is after Moses comes down from the mount. He sees all the wickedness that's going on. And Moses said unto Aaron, what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? What did they do? What, 
What did they do to you that would cause you to do something this stupid? I wonder if God's going to say that to some of these preachers. Why would you bring that kind of music in the church? What did the people in that church do? Explain that to me. What would make a pastor change their Bible? What would make a pastor stop preaching the truth? Is it money? Because where do you see the rewards you missed out on for not preaching the truth, not being in season out of season? And Moses asked Aaron, what did these people do to you? And it says, and Aaron said, let not thine anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief, blaming the people. For they said unto me, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what was become of him. And I said unto them, whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Now, is that what happened? No, the Bible says Aaron fashioned it. Aaron was the one that made it. Aaron made that golden calf. And it's these preachers that are bringing in all this stupidity, that's bringing in all this technology, that's bringing in the false versions, the contemporary music, you know, doing it because the people are demanding it. But it's them that are doing it. But Aaron here, you know, he's lying. You know, I mean, I just we threw the gold there and it, just, it came out. You know, it, it just happened. You know, and, and that's what a lot of these preachers are. It's like, you know, you know, Pastor Trendy, you know, why do you have to look like a queer when you're preaching? You know, why are you preaching in skinny jeans and wearing a pink shirt? You know, hey, this is, this, this is the times. Just change with the times. You know, it's, it just happens. Sorry, that's not an excuse. Listen, I like to think the only thing that you all could ever do to get me in skinny jeans is to, you know, paralyze me and, you know, put them on me when I'm not able to put up a fight. That, that's why I, I like to think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down kicking and screaming before you get those things on me. But... These guys are proudly doing it in church. I mean, just look like, I'm not going to say it, but it just, it, it makes me sick it, and, and it's wrong, but they do, you know, these, that, that trendy, they're very influenced by society like Aaron was. I don't want to make the people mad at me. They are, they spend so much time on social media. They know what's trending. They know what people like. They know what people don't like. They are very tuned into those things. They read the Facebook comments you know, on Monday, that the people were saying about the church on Sunday, ah, oh, this music was boring Sunday. You know, they'll read those things. Oh, man, I can't believe that. And, and so what do they do? You know, they buckle. They change. And they do the, that trendy, they have an extremely strong emphasis on community. That's one of their favorite words right now. Right now. It'll, you know, it'll, the word will probably go to something else eventually. But, you know... The Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The majority is always going to be going the wrong direction. The majority, our community is always going to be interested in things that they should not be interested in. What is trending in America? You can just count on it always being the wrong thing. We are not supposed to go along with the community. We are supposed to stand in a gap. We're supposed to make up the hedge. We're supposed to be somebody who you know, is, is trying to lead by example. Once again, in, in season and out of season. And, but they, they are, they're, very, they're so emphasized or they're so focused on the community that they are, they're terrified of displeasing the community. That's who they're serving. That's who they're interested in. They are very concerned about how they are perceived by the community. I preached on it last week or the week before. We're fools for Christ's sake, folks. If we're going to do things like God told us to do, we are going to look like fools to the world, and a trendy can't stand that. They can't stand looking like a fool. But listen, we can't, we can't worry about that. I'm more interested in how I'm perceived by God. That's a, I'm serving God. And, but these guys that are serving the community, their relationship with the community is of the utmost importance. You know, we got, you know, we got, we're going to bring the mayor in. We're going to honor him. We're going to give him a plaque for being mayor. And, you know, we're going to you know, bring in the police officers and the firemen, bring in all these lost people, and we're going to give them awards so we can have a good relationship with the community. Well, listen. 
I don't see in the Bible where it tells us to worry that much about that. In fact, Jesus said in uh, John chapter 15, verse 18, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Listen, if we do that, when the, and these churches too, they're not being fake when they bring in all these community people in and are giving them their awards and everything showing that they are one with the community. They are part of the community. But listen, we are not a part of the community. We are a congregation of believers. We are a set-apart people. We are God's people. And the world will hate us. The world will love its own. And if we get worldly enough, we can make the community love us. But that's not what we're trying to do. The world hates our Lord and if we're like our Lord, they will hate us too. And people are, they're so terrified of that. And that's why these preachers are backing off and password protecting their sermons and things because they don't want it getting out there because they can't handle people hating them. They can't handle the persecution. Their desire to be loved can only be fulfilled by the world because they have no faith. You see, we are required to have faith quite a bit in the Christian life, aren't we? In fact, the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. But what is more gratifying to these people? Getting asked to go pray at the city council meeting or finding a verse in the scripture where it says, be instant out of, in season, out of season. And you said, I believe I'm doing that. And by faith, I believe I've, I'm pleasing God. And, and when, so when we're pleasing God, God doesn't just always shower us with blessings. He doesn't send an angel to come tell us how wonderful we are and give us a shiny plaque that we can put in our office. We don't get those things. Those of us who are, you know, God is smiling. If, you know, if God is smiling on us, if we are pleasing God, we believe that by faith. And that's not always easy. It's a lot easier to have the mayor shake your hand and have everybody clap for you. And, you know, we want this person who's doing great things for the community. Such a blessing. They cleaned up, you know, Fifth Avenue. You know, they did this. You know, they painted the graffiti off the wall on some building. What a wonderful church. And everybody clap. It's a lot easier to get that. You don't, it doesn't require faith being loved by the world. You can get instant gratification. But being, you know, but pleasing God, we only believe we are by faith. And so they, but these people, they don't have faith, and that's why they have to have acceptance from the world. They can't handle it. If somebody puts a negative review about them on Facebook, I mean, what are we going to do? They're calling up Facebook. I mean, what, what can I do to get this removed? I mean, these people are saying bad things about our church. They gave us one star. What's the community going to think? You know, who cares? Yeah, who cares? Oh, you know, they left a nasty comment. Uh, you know, on the YouTube channel, they didn't like that sermon that you preached. Oh, well. Listen, I'm encouraged when I get a thumbs down on some of these messages because it tells me there's probably some queer listening to it and they needed to hear it, you know. Maybe it planted a seed in their heart. If everybody's liking what I'm saying, well, that means they probably already agree. So I didn't really help them. I want to reach out to people who don't agree with me. And it's, some of this stuff's going to make them mad at first. But maybe they'll get their curiosity. Maybe they'll come back and they'll listen again. And maybe they'll start to learn some things. I don't know. But, you know, the trendy there, they they're terrified of doing anything that will offend the lost. First Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and do his marvelous light. Jesus Christ is a rock of offense. The gospel is an offense. The simplicity of the gospel is an offense to many people. Jesus, a Jesus only gospel is offensive. When you say Jesus is the only way to heaven, you've just offended. I mean, mil billions of people. But it's the truth. Right. The Muslims aren't going to get to heaven through Allah. They have to go through Jesus Christ. I, and I'm sorry. I know. You know. I know. We're supposed to love those Jews, and we're just supposed to. You know. And, and people, 
are literally, they go and they give, and I'm all for giving Bibles to Jews. I'm 100% for that. But when they go, they'll go to these jewelry stores and all the places where the Jews usually own, and they give them these Bibles, and they give them, when they give them the Bible, they give it to them as a thank you for them giving us the Word of God and giving us the Messiah because Jesus was a Jew, and it was Jews who wrote the Scriptures and helped preserve the Scriptures, and they go doing it thanking these people for it. And listen, you're not helping a Jew by thanking them for things. You can help them by giving them the gospel and telling them, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. Your people crucified their own Messiah. You need to believe in him and get saved. But listen, when you say the name of Jesus, you offend a Jew. But I'm sorry. Jesus Christ is their only chance of getting into heaven. He's the, he's the only way. And so we're going to have to offend these people. I don't want to offend them. I'm not going to try to offend them. I'm not going to go up to them and make jokes about their little beanies they wear and things like that. But you know what? I will do the most offensive thing you can do to a Jew and talk about Jesus. Because it's, it's the only chance I've got to help him. And he is a stumbling stone. He is a rock of offense. These you know, other Christian religions that teach a works-based salvation, they will be offended by the simplicity of the gospel that we preach here. They will be offended by what we teach when it comes to things like repentance. They will be offended by that. But you know what? It's their only chance of getting saved. I have to tell them that. I'm going to have to offend some of these people. Not the goal. Not trying to, but the trendy. They can't handle offending anybody. They can't offend, handle making people uncomfortable, and therefore they're not helping anybody. And we've got to do these things. The message of Christ, it does not set well with our flesh. And the trendy, they think it's possible to make Christ, Christianity appealing. It's not appealing to the world. It's not supposed to be appealing to the world. It, the things of God, they go against this flesh. And the trendy, they're not forceful in their personality, in their presentation. They're not bold. You know, they, you know it's like when they, do, when they start talking about sin, before they bring up sin, they got to spend 15 minutes apologizing for all their sins. Because I don't want to make these people feel bad for their sin. I don't want them to think that, you know, them to think that I think I'm somebody special. And so it's like, you know, they do. They, they got to do this big, long apology before they bring up the fact that you're a sinner. Well, listen, you know, just preach the truth. All right. And, you know, pray the Holy Spirit does a work. Oh, we're supposed to speak the truth in love. We got to speak the truth in love. And we should speak the truth in love. But let me tell you something. I personally believe speaking the truth in love will all, almost always involve a lot of yelling. And you don't hear these guys yelling in church. Why is that? You know, why, why, you know, why don't they yell? Well, it makes people uncomfortable. But listen, proof that preaching the truth or speaking the truth in love will involve yelling. Who loves you more than parents? How much yelling does parents do with their kids? Okay, if you see your kid, your little baby, you know, going to stick his finger in a light socket or something, you are going to scream at them. Why? Because you love them. You don't want them to get electrocuted. You know, you do. You're going to yell at them when they're doing these things that are dangerous. And listen, when we're out there preaching the gospel, if these people don't get saved, they're going to go to hell. If we actually love people, we're not going to go in there. You know, we're not going to go talking all soft and meek and gentle. No, we're going to preach the truth. We're going to yell. We're going to do whatever we have to do to get their attention. And so that the trendy, they don't, and, and I'm, I'm out of time. I'll just go through these things quickly. But, you know, they don't stand out in their attire. So, and they, they've got to be non-threatening. And one thing that we're also known for in Christianity is we're real big on, you know, fundamental Baptist, especially we've always been real big on masculinity. Men being men, women being women. That's not popular today. And so, you know, if you can do this metrosexual stuff, I guess it's called, you know, it, it makes you not as threatening. You know, it's, it's the non-threatening look. And listen, if being masculine is threatening, then I, I hope I threaten people. <laughs> you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go all girly just to make people more comfortable. And, but they don't, they don't stand out. The Bible says come out from among them be separate. There should be a difference. There is an us and a them. The difference ought to be clear. There's men and there's women. You ought to be able to tell a man or woman from a long distance. And that's another thing about cities. 
when we were in Chicago. It's tough to tell. Don't get me going on that. But, you know, they, they love trendies. They love what the Bible says when the Bible says whosoever will may come. But they forget to explain who they're coming to and where they're coming from. You've got to explain, hey, there's a holy God. You're a sinner. And they don't want to do that. And so what's the big deal? But that, the, you know, the trendy, they don't realize that sugarcoating the message as a method of not being offensive is only going to cause them to be offended later. If you go back in John 16, Jesus was warning the disciples about all these things that were going to come their way. You're going to be put out of the synagogues. People are going to try to kill you. He was telling them all these things. And he said, I tell you these things. So when they happen, you won't be offended. Well, the trendy, the, the sugarcoating things, they're not preparing people for what's coming. There's difficulties that are going to come their way. There's going to be challenges. And if we're just making everything this little comfortable, happy, go lucky, song and dance type of preaching, where, you know, these people, they are, they're going to be offended. They're going to fall out when reality hits them. When challenges come their way, they're not going to be ready for it. And they did. They're, they're so scared of offending people. And listen, you know, preaching, preaching that we're, you know, we're going to go through tribulation, that is not popular today. People are terrified of that. They're offended by that. But listen, I would rather make you uncomfortable right now and offend you right now than for later you to find yourself smack dab in the middle of tribulation and then lose faith because we weren't supposed to go through this. You know, we were promised, you know, happy-go-lucky life, you know, no problems coming our way and then just, boom, raptured. But no, that's, I would, I would rather offend you now. I would rather make you uncomfortable right now. But Pastor Trendy's not going to do that. You show me the guy wearing the weird microphone preaching, you're going to go through tribulation. I'll pay attention to that guy. In fact, if you can show me somebody preaching that this week with one of those microphones, I will wear one of those microphones, all right? That, that's a dare, all right? Just a little bet I'm throwing out there. You show me one of those guys wearing those mics, preaching, preaching that, slamming the sodomites, and I'll wear one of those just for fun, just to make myself look stupid. But, any, you know, but you're not going to do it. It's, it's just not going to happen. But the, the real problem with these trendies is they love themselves. Second Timothy 3, the Bible says, you know, that in the last days they're going to wax, you know, perilous times will become, for men shall be lovers of themselves. Mr. Trendy, Pastor Trendy in his pink shirt, he loves himself. He doesn't love people. They talk about love, but he is desperate to be loved by everyone. And that's why he doesn't want to offend anybody. He doesn't want anybody to say anything negative with him. And proof Pastor Trendy loves himself too. You know, Pastor Trendy is one of those guys too carrying around the selfie sticks, taking selfies all the time. I'm 36 years old. Am I 36? Yeah, 36 years old. And I'm, I'm at zero selfies. I refuse to take selfies. I just, you know, you ladies, I, my wife was taking selfies before cell phone cameras. I remember she, I'd watch her with the camera. You know, girls, teenage girls do that. They've been doing that stuff for years. I've got no problem with that. But let me tell you, guys going around taking selfies, we're supposed to not want to be in pictures. You know, we're supposed to put up a fight when we're going to be in pictures. And when you as a man are walking around snapping pictures of yourself, I'm sorry, you disturb me greatly. <laughs> you know, you, you love yourself. And that's why you do these things. And that, that's the trendy, folks. That's the profile of a trendy. I think it's dangerous. Not everything they do is bad. They might start something that is good. They accidentally get some things right sometimes, but I believe it's a very dangerous path to take, and I'm not interested in it. I think there's a lot of problems with it, and I think it's doing a lot of damage in Baptist churches, and I want to stay away from it. And so I hope that helps explain, you know, but that's time why, you know, everybody else is doing this stuff. Why aren't you doing it? I'll do it when it stops trending. All right? I'm not interested in that, and so I hope that's a help. So let's all stand right now.